The Stoker and the Stars by Algris Budris Written as John A. Sentry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stoker and the Stars by Algris Budris When you've had your ears pinned back in a bow knot, it's sometimes hard to remember that an intelligent people has no respect for a whipped enemy, but does for a fairly beaten enemy. Know him? Yes, I know him, knew him. That was twenty years ago. Everybody knows him now. Everybody who passed him on the street knows him. Everybody who went to the same schools, or even to different schools in different towns, knows him now. Ask them. But I knew him. I lived three feet away from him for a month and a half. I shipped with him, and called him by his first name. What was he like? What was he thinking, sitting on the edge of his bunk with his jaw in his palm, and his eyes on the stars? What did he think he was after? Well, well, I think he, you know, I think I never did know him after all. Not well. Not as well as some of those people who are writing books about him seem to. I couldn't really describe him to you. He had a duffel bag in his hand and a packed air suit on his back. The skin of his face had been dried out by ship's air, burned by ultraviolet and broiled by infrared. The pupils of his eyes had little cloudy specks in them where the cosmic rays had shot through them. But his eyes were steady and his body was hard. What did he look like? He looked like a man. It was after the war. We were beaten. There used to be a school of thought among us that deplored our combativeness, before we had even met any people from off Earth, even. You could hear people saying, we were the toughest, cruelest life form in the universe, unfit to mingle with the gentler, wiser races in the stars, and a sure bet to steal their galaxy and corrupt it forever. Where these people got their information, I don't know. We were beaten. We moved out beyond Centaurus and Sirius, and then we met the Jex, and the Noser Way, and the Lud. We tried terrestrial know-how, we tried production miracles, we tried patriotism, we tried damming the torpedoes in full speed ahead, and we were smashed back like mayflies in the wind. We died in droves, and we retreated from the guttering fires of a dozen planets. We dug in, we fought through the last ditch. We were dying on Earth itself before Baker mutinied shot cope and surrendered the remainder of the human race to a wiser gentler race in the stars that way we lived that way we were permitted to carry on our little concerns and mind our manners the jecks and the luds and the noser ways returned to their own affairs and we knew they would leave us alone so long as we didn't bother them we liked it that way understand me we didn't accept it we didn't knuckle under with a waiting murder in our hearts. We liked it. We were grateful just to be left alone again. We were happy. We hadn't been wiped out like the upstarts the rest of the universe thought us to be. When they let us keep our own solar system and carry on a trickle of trade with the outside, we accepted it for the fantastically generous gift it was. Too many of our best men were dead for us to have any remaining claim on those things in our own right. I know how it was. I was there twenty years ago. I was a little, pudgy man, with short breath and a high-pitched voice. I was a typical Earthman. We were out on a godforsaken landing field on Mars, MacReady and I, loading cargo aboard the Centaurus. MacReady was the first officer. I was the second. The stranger came walking up to us. Got a job? he asked, looking at MacReady. Mac looked him over. He saw the same things I'd seen. He shook his head. Not for you. The only thing we're short on is stokers. You wouldn't know. There's no such thing as a stoker anymore with automatic ships. But the stranger knew what Mac meant. Centaurus had what we called an electronic drive. She had to run through an evacuated engine room. 
the leaking electricity would have broken any stray air down to ozone which eats metal and rots lungs so the engine room had the air pumped out of her and the stokers who tended the dials and set the cathode attitudes had to wear suits smelling themselves for twelve hours at a time and standing a good chance of being cooked where they sat when the drive arced Cenerus was an ugly old tub at that we were the better of the two interstellar freighters the human race had left you're bound over the border aren't you macready nodded that's right but i'll stoke macready looked over toward me and frowned i shrugged my shoulders helplessly i was a little afraid of the stranger too the trouble was the look of him it was the look you saw in the bars back on earth where the veterans of the war sat and stared down into their glasses waiting for night to fall so they could go out in the alleys and have drunken fights among themselves he had brought that look to mars to the landing field and out here there was something disquieting about it he caught max look and turned his head to me i'll stoke he repeated i didn't know what to say macready and i almost all of the men in the merchant marine hadn't served in combat arms we had freighted supplies and we had seen ships dying on the runs we had our own brushes with commerce raiders and we'd known enough men who joined the combat forces but very few of the men came back and the war this man had fought hadn't been the same as ours he'd commanded a fighting ship somewhere and come to grips with things we simply didn't know about the mark was on him but not on us i couldn't meet his eyes okay by me i mumbled at last i saw mercredi's mouth turn down at the corners but he couldn't gainsay the man more than i could mercredi wasn't a mumbling man so he said angrily okay bucko you'll stoke go and sign on thanks the stranger walked quietly away he wrapped a hand around the cable on the cargo hook and rode it into the hold on top of some freight max spat on the ground and went back to supervising his end of the loading i was busy with mine and it wasn't until we'd gotten the serenus loaded and buttoned down that mac and i even spoke to each other again then we talked about the trip we didn't talk about the stranger daniels the third had signed him on and had moved him into the empty bunk above mine we slept all in a bunch on the centaurus officers and crew even so we had to sleep in shifts with the ship's designers giving ninety percent of her space to cargo and eight percent to power and control that left very little for the people who were crammed in any way they could be i said empty bunk what i meant was empty during my sleep shift that meant he and i'd be sharing work shifts me up in the control blister parked in a soft chair and him down in the engine room broiling in a soup for twelve hours but i ate with him used the head with him you could call that rubbing elbows with greatness if you want to he was a very quiet man quiet in the way he moved and talked when we were both climbing into our bunks that first night i introduced myself and he introduced himself then he heaved himself onto the bunk rolled over on his side fixed his straps and fell asleep he was always friendly toward me but he must have been very tired that first night i often wonder what kind of a life he'd lived after the war what he'd done that made him different from the men who simply grew older in the bars i wonder now if he really did do anything different in an odd way i like to think that one day in a bar on a day that seemed like all the rest to him when it began he suddenly looked up with some new thought put down his glass and walked straight to the earth mars shuttle field he might have come from any town on earth don't believe the historians too much don't pay too much attention to the chamber of commerce plaques when a man's name becomes public property strange things happen to the facts it was macready who first found out what he'd done during the war i've got to explain about macready he takes his opinions fast and strong he's a good man is 
or was. I haven't seen him for a long while. But he liked things simple. MacReady said the duffel bag broke loose and floated into the middle of the bunk room during acceleration. He opened it to see whose it was. When he found out, he closed it up and strapped it back into its place at the foot of the stoker's bunk. MacReady was my relief on the bridge. When he came up, he didn't relieve me right away. He stood next to my chair and looked out through the ports. Captain, leave any instructions in the order book, he asked. Just the usual. Keep a tight watch and proceed cautiously. That new stoker, Max said. Yeah. I knew there was something wrong with him. He's got an old marine uniform in his duffel. I didn't say anything. Mac glanced over at me. Well? I don't know. I didn't. I couldn't say I was surprised. It had been something like that about the stoker. The mark was on him, as I've said. It was the Marines that did Earth's best dying. It had to be. They were trained to be the best we had, and they believed in their training. They were the ones who slashed back the deepest when the other side hit us. They were the ones who sallied out in the doomed spaces between the stars and took the war to the other side as well as any human force could ever hope to. They were always the last to leave an abandoned position. If Earth had been giving medals to members of her forces in the war, every man in the Corps would have had a medal of honor two or three times over. Posthumously. I don't believe there were ten of them alive when Cope was shot. Cope was one of them. They were the kind of human beings neither MacReady nor I could hope to understand. You don't know, Max said. It's there in his duffel. Damn it. We're going to be out to trade with his sworn enemies. Why do you suppose he's so eager to go? You think he's going to try to start something? Think? That's exactly what he's going to do. One last big alley fight. One last brawl. When they cut him down, do you suppose they'll stop with him? They'll kill us, and then they'll go in and stamp Earth flat. You know it as well as I do. I don't know, Mac, I said. Go easy. I could feel the knots in my stomach. I didn't want any trouble. Not from the stoker. Not from Mac. None of us wanted trouble. Not even Mac. But he'd cause it to get rid of it, if you follow what I mean about his kind of man. Mac hit the viewport with his fist. Easy, easy. Nothing's easy. I hate this life, he said in a murderous voice. I don't know why I keep signing on. Mars to Centaurus and back, back and forth. In this old rust tub that's going to blow herself up, one of these Daniels called me on the phone from communications. Turn up your intercom volume, he said. Stoker's jamming the circuit. I kicked the selector switch over, and this is what I got. So there we were, a million miles per, and the air was getting thick, and the skipper said, Cheer up, brave boys, we'll... He was singing. He had a terrible voice, but he could carry a tune, and he was hammering it out at the top of his lungs. "'Twas the last cruise of the Venus, by God you should have seen us. The pipes were full of whiskey, and just to make things risky, the jets were... The crew were chuckling in their own chest phones. I could hear Daniels trying to cut him off, but he kept going. I started laughing myself. No one's supposed to jam an intercom, but it made the crew feel good. When the crew feels good, the ship runs right, and it had been a long time since they'd been happy. He went on for another twenty minutes. Then his voice thinned out, and I heard him cough a little. Daniels, he said. Get a relief down here for me. Jump to it. He said the last part in a master's voice. Daniels didn't ask questions. He sent a man on his way down. He'd been singing, the stoker had. He'd been singing while he worked with one arm dead, one sleeve ripped open and badly patched, because the fabric was slippery with blood. There'd been a flashover in the drivers. By the time his relief got down there, he had the insulation back on, and the driver was purring along the way it should have been. It hadn't even missed a beat. 
he went down to sickbay, got the arm wrapped, and would have gone back on shift if Daniel to let him. Those of us going off shift found him toying with the theremin in the mess compartment. He didn't know how to play it, and it sounded like a dog howling. Sing, will you? somebody yelled. He grinned and went back to the good ship Venus. It wasn't good, but it was loud. From that we went to stairways, fairways, and barways, and the freefall song. Someone started, I left her behind for you, and that got us off into sentimental things, the way these sessions would sometimes wind up when spacemen were far from home. But not since the war, we all seemed to realize together. We stopped and looked at each other, and we all began to drift out of the mess compartment. And maybe it got to him, too. It may explain something. He and I were the last ones to leave. We went to the bunk room, and he stopped in the middle of taking off his shirt. He stood there, looking out of the porthole, and forgot I was there. I heard him reciting something softly under his breath, and I stepped a little closer. This was what it was. The rockets rise against the skies slowly, in the sunlight gleaming. With silver hue upon the blue, the universe waits dreaming. For men must go where the flame winds blow, the gas clouds softly plating where stars are spun and worlds begun, and men will find them waiting. The song that roars where the rocket soars is the song of stellar flame. The dreams of man and galactic span are equal and much the same. What was he thinking of? Make your own choice. I think I came closer to knowing him at that moment, but until human beings turn telepath, no man can be sure of another. He shook himself like a dog out of cold water and got into his bunk. I got into mine, and after a while I fell asleep. I don't know what MacReady might have told the skipper about the stoker, or if he tried to tell him anything. The captain was the senior ticket holder in the merchant service, and a good man in his day. He kept mostly to his cabin, and there was nothing MacReady could do on his own authority. Nothing simple, that is and the stoker had saved the ship. I think what kept anything from happening between MacReady and the stoker, or anyone else in the stoker, was that it would have meant trouble in the ship. Trouble, confined to our little percentage of the ship's volume, could seem like something much more important than the fate of the human race. It might not seem that way to you, but as long as no one began anything, we could all get along. We could have a good trip. MacReady worried, I'm sure. I worried, sometimes. But nothing happened. When we reached Alpha Centaurus and set down at the trading field on the second planet, it was the same as the other trips we'd made, and the same kind of landfall. The Lud Factor came out of his post after we waited for a while, and gave us our permit to disembark. There was a Jack ship on the other end of the field. Loaded with cargo, we would get in exchange for our hold full of goods. We had the usual things. Wine, music tapes, furs, and the like. The Jecks had been giving us light machinery lately. Probably we'd get two or three more loads, and then they'd begin giving us something else. But I found that this trip wasn't quite the same. I found myself looking at the factor's post and I realized for the first time that the Lud hadn't built it. It was left over from the old colonial human government. And the city on the horizon? Men had built it. The touch of our architecture was on every building. I wondered why it never occurred to me that this was so. It made the landfall different from all others, somehow. It gave a new face to the entire planet. Mac and I and some of the other crewmen went down on the field to handle the unloading. Jex on self-propelled cargo lifts jockeyed among us, scooping up loads as we unhooked the slings, bringing cases of machinery from their own ship. They sat atop their vehicles, lean and aloof, dashing in, whirling, shooting across the field to their own ship, and back like wild horsemen on the plains of Earth, paying us no notice. We were almost through when Max suddenly grabbed my arm. Look! 
The stoker was coming down on one of the cargo slings. He stood upright, his booted feet planted wide, one arm curled up over his head and around the hoist cable. He was in his dusty brown marine uniform, the scarlet collar tabs bright as blood at his throat, his major's insignia glittering on his shoulders, the battle stripes on his sleeves. The jacks stopped their lifts. They knew that uniform. They sat up in their saddles and watched him come down. When the sling touched the ground, he jumped off quietly and walked toward the nearest jack. They all followed him with their eyes. We've got to stop him, Max said, and both of us started toward him. His hands were both in plain sight, one holding his duffel bag, which was swelled out with the bulk of his air suit. He wasn't carrying a weapon of any kind. He was walking casually, taking his time. Mac and I had almost reached him when a jack with insignia on his coveralls suddenly jumped down from his lift and came forward to meet him. It was an odd thing to see, the stoker and the jack who did not stand as tall. MacReady and I stepped back. The jack was coal black, his scales glittering in the cold sunlight, his hatchet face inscrutable. He stopped when the stoker was a few paces away. The stoker stopped, too. All the jacks were watching him and paying no attention to anything else. The field might as well have been empty except for those two. They'll kill him. They'll kill him right now, MacReady whispered. They ought to have. If I'd been a jack, I would have thought that uniform was a death warrant. But the jack spoke to him. Are you entitled to wear that? I was at this planet in 39. I was closer to your home world the year before that, the stoker said. I was captain of a destroyer. If I'd had a cruiser's range, I would have reached it. He looked at the jack. Where were you? I was here when you were. I want to speak to your ship's captain. All right, I'll drive you over. The stoker nodded and they walked over to his vehicle together. They drove away toward the Jack ship. All right, let's get back to work, another Jack said to MacReady and myself, and we went back to unloading cargo. The stoker came back to our ship that night without his duffel bag. He found me and said, I'm signed off the ship, going with the Jacks. MacReady was with me. He said loudly, What do you mean you're going with the Jacks? I signed onto their ship, the stoker said, stoking. They've got a micro-nuclear drive. It's been a while since I worked with one, but I think I can make out all right, even with the screwball way they've got it set up. Huh? The stoker shrugged. Ships are ships, and physics is physics, no matter where you go. I'll make out. What kind of a deal did you make with them? What do you think you're up to? The stoker shook his head. No deal. I signed on as a crewman. I'll do a crewman's work for a crewman's wage. I thought I'd wander around a while. It ought to be interesting, he said. On a jack ship? Anybody's ship. When I get to their home world, I'll probably ship out with some people from further on. Why not? It's honest work. MacReady had no answer to that. But, I said, what? He looked at me as if he couldn't understand what might be bothering me, but I think perhaps he could. Nothing, I said, and that was that, except MacReady was always a sourer man from that time up to as long as I knew him afterwards. We took off in the morning. The stoker had already left on the jack ship, and it turned out he'd trained an apprentice boy to take his place. It was strange how things became different for us little by little after that. It was never anything you could put your finger on, but the Jacks began taking more goods and giving us things we needed when we told them we wanted them. After a while, Cenerus was going a little deeper into Jack territory, and when she wore out, the two replacements led us trade with the Lud, too. Then it was the Noser way, and other people beyond them, and things just got better for us somehow. I heard about our stoker occasionally. He shipped with the Lud and the Noserway, 
and some people beyond them, getting along, going to all kinds of places. Pay no attention to the precise red lines you see on star maps. Nobody knows exactly what path he wandered from people to people. Nobody could. He just kept signing on with whatever ship was going deeper into the galaxy, going further and further. He messed with green shipmates and blue ones. One and two and three heads, tails, six legs. After all, ships are ships, and they've all got to have something to push them along. If a man knows his business, why not? A man can live on all kinds of food if he wants to get used to it, and any non-toxic atmosphere will do as long as there's enough oxygen in it. I don't know what he did to make things so much better for us. I don't know if he did anything but stoke their ships, and, I suppose, fix them when they were in trouble. I wonder if he sang dirty songs in the bad voice of his to people who couldn't possibly understand what the songs were about. All I know is, for some reason, those people slowly began treating us with respect. We changed, too, I think. I'm not the same man I was, I think. Not altogether the same. I'm a captain now, with a master's papers, and you won't find me in my cabin very often. There's a kind of a joy in standing on a bridge, looking out at the stars you're moving toward. I wonder if it mightn't have kept my old captain out of that place he died in, finally if he'd tried it. So I don't know. The older I get, the less I know. The thing people remember the stoker for, the thing that makes him famous, and I think annoys him, I am fairly sure is only incidental to what he really did, if he did anything, if he meant to. I wish I could be sure of the exact answer he found in the bottom of that last glass at the bar, before he worked his passage to Mars and the centerist, and began it all. So I can't say what he ought to be famous for. But I suppose it's enough to know for sure that he was the first living being ever to travel all the way around the galaxy. The End of The Stoker and the Stars by Algris Budris Written as John A. Sentry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stuff by Henry Slazer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman Would it work? Yes. How would it work? Exactly like this. The Stuff by Henry Slazer No more lies, Paula said. For God's sake, Doctor, no more lies. I've been living with lies for the past year, and I'm tired of them. Bernstein closed the white door before answering, mercifully obscuring the sheeted, motionless mound on the hospital bed. He took the young woman's elbow and walked with her down the tiled corridor. He's dying, of course, he said conversationally. We've never lied to you about that, Mrs. Hill. You know what we've told you all along. I hope that by now you'd feel more resigned. I was, she said bitterly. They had stopped in front of Bernstein's small office, and she drew her arm away. But when you called me, about this drug of yours. We had to call you. Sinepoline can't be administered without permission of the patient. And since your husband has been in a coma for the last four days... He opened the door and nodded her inside. She hesitated, then walked in. He took his place behind the cluttered desk, his grave face distracted, and waited until she sat down in the facing chair. He picked up his telephone receiver, replaced it, shuffled papers, and then locked his hands on the desk blotter. Sinepoline is a curious drug, he said. I've had little experience with it myself. You may have heard about the controversy surrounding it. No, she whispered. I don't know about it. I haven't cared about anything since Andy's illness. At any rate, you're the only person in the world that can decide whether your husband receives it. It's strange stuff, as I've said. But in the light of your husband's present condition, I can tell you this. It can do him absolutely no harm. 
but will it do him good there bernstein sighed is the crux of the controversy mrs hill row 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 your boat he sang in his mind feeling the lapping tongues of the cool lake water against his fingers drifting drifting under abyssinent willows paula's hands were resting gently on his eyes and he lifted them away then he kissed the soft palms and pressed them on his cheek when he opened his eyes he was surprised to find that the boat was a bed the water only pelting rain against the window and the willow trees long shadows on the walls only paula's hands were real solid and real and comforting against his face he grinned at her funniest damn thing he said for a minute there i thought we were back at finger lake remember that night we sprang a leak i'll never forget the way you looked when you saw the hem of your dress andy she said quietly andy do you know what's happened he scratched his head seems to me doc bernstein was in here a while ago or was he didn't they jab me again or something it was a drug andy don't you remember they have this new miracle drug sinipoline dr bernstein told you about it and said it was worth a try oh sure i remember he sat up in bed casually as if sitting up in bed were an everyday occurrence he took a cigarette from the table beside him and lit one he smoked reflectively for a moment and then recalled that he hadn't been anything but horizontal for almost eight months swiftly he put his hands on his ribcage and touched the firm flesh the girdle he said wonderingly where the hell's the girdle they took it off paula said tearfully oh andy they took it off you don't need it any more you're healed completely healed it's a miracle a miracle she threw her arms around him they hadn't held each other since the accident a year ago the accident that had snapped his spine in several places he had been 22 when it happened they released him from the hospital three days later after half a year in the hushed white world the city outside seemed wildly clamorous and riotously colorful like a town at the height of carnival he had never felt so well in his life he was eager to put the strong springs of his muscles back into play bernstein had made the usual speech about rest but a week after his discharge andy and paula were at the courts in tennis clothes andy had always been a dedicated player but his stiff arm forehand and poor net game had always prevented him from being anything more than a passable amateur now he was a demon on the court no ball escaped his swift moving racket he astounded himself with the accuracy of his crashing serves his incredible play at the net paula a junior champion during her college years couldn't begin to cope with him laughingly she gave up and watched him battle the club professional he took the first set six o six o six o and andy knew that something more magical than medicinal had happened to him they talked it over excited as school children all the way home Andy, who had taken a job in a stock brokerage house after college, and who had been bored silly with the whole business until the accident, began wondering if he could make a career on the tennis court. To make sure his superb play wasn't a fluke, they returned to the club the next day. This time, Andy found a former Davis Cup challenger to compete with. At the end of the afternoon, his heart pounding with the beat of victory, he knew it was true. That night, with Paula in his lap, he stroked her long auburn hair and said, No, Paula, it's all wrong. I'd like to keep it up, maybe enter the Nationals, but that's no life for me. It's only a game, after all. Only a game, she said mockingly. That's a fine thing for the next top-seated man to say. No, I'm serious. Oh, I don't mean I intend to stay in Wall Street that's not my ambition either as a matter of fact i was thinking of painting again painting you haven't painted since your freshman year you think you can make a living at it i was always pretty good you know that i'd like to try doing some commercial illustration that's for the bread and potatoes then when we don't have to worry about creditors i'd like to do some things on my own don't pull a gauguin on me friend she kissed his cheek lightly 
Don't desert your wife and family for some Tahitian idol. What family? She pulled away from him and got up to stir the ashes in the fireplace. When she returned, her face was glowing with the heat of the fire and the warmth of her news. Andrew Hills, Jr. was born in September. Two years later, little Denise took over the hand-me-down cradle. By that time, Andy Hill was signing his name to magazine covers of America's top circulation weeklies, and they were happy to feature it. His added fame as America's top-ranked amateur tennis champion made the signature all the more desirable. When Andrew Jr. was three, Andrew Sr. made his most important advance in the field of art, not on the cover of a Saturday Evening Post, but in the halls of the Modern Museum of Art. His first exhibit evoked such a torrent of superlatives that the New York Times found the reaction newsworthy enough for a box on its front page. There was a celebration in the Hills household that night, attended by their closest friends. Copies of slick magazines were ceremoniously burned, and the ashes placed in a dime store urn that Paula had bought for the occasion. A month later they were signing the documents that entitled them to a sprawling, hilltop house in Westchester, with a northern light glassed-in studio the size of their former apartment. He was thirty-five when the urge struck him to rectify a sordid political situation in their town. His fame as an artist and tennis champion, even at thirty-five, he was top-seated in the Nationals, gave him an easy entree into the political melee. At first the idea of vote-seeking appalled him. But he couldn't retreat once the movement started. He won easily and was elected to the town council. The office was a minor one, but he was enough of a celebrity to attract countrywide attention. During the following year, he began to receive visits from important men in party circles. In the next state election, his name was on the ballot. By the time he was forty, Andrew Hills was a U.S. senator. That spring, he and Paula spent a month in Acapulco, in an enchanting home they had erected in the cool shadows of the steep mountain that faced the bay. It was there that Andy talked about his future. I know what the party's planning, he told his wife, but I know they're wrong. I'm not presidential timber, Paula. But the decision wasn't necessary. By summer, the Asiatic Alliance had tired of the incessant talks with the peacemakers and had launched their attack on the Alaskan frontier. Andy was commissioned at once as a major. His gallantry in action, his brilliant recapturing of Shechtelik, White Mountain, and eventual triumphant march into Nome guaranteed him a place in the high command of the Allied armies. By the end of the first year of fighting, there were two silver stars on his shoulders and he was given the most critical assignment of all, to represent the Allies in the negotiations that were taking place in Fox Island in the Aleutians. Later, he denied that he was solely responsible for the successful culmination of the peace talks, but the American populace thought him hero enough to sweep him into the White House the following year, in a landslide victory unparalleled in political history. He was fifty by the time he left Washington but his greatest triumphs were yet to come. In his second term, his interest in the world organization had given him a major role in world politics. As first secretary of the World Council, his ability to effect working compromise between the ideological factions was directly responsible for the establishment of the world government. When he was 64, Andrew Hills was elected world president. He held the office until his voluntary retirement at seventy-five. Still active and vigorous, still capable of a commanding tennis game, of a painting that set the art circles gasping, he and Paula moved permanently into the house in Acapulco. He was ninety-six when the fatigue of living overtook him. Andrew, Jr., with his four grandchildren, and Denise, with her charming twins, paid him one last visit before he took to his bed. But what is the stuff? Paula said. Does it cure or what? I have a right to know. Dr. Bernstein frowned. It's rather hard to describe. It has no curative powers. It's more in the nature of a hypnotic drug, but it has a rather peculiar effect. 
It provokes a dream. A dream? Yes, an incredibly long and detailed dream in which the patient lives an entire lifetime and lives it just the way he would like it to be. You might say it's an opiate, but it's the most humane one ever developed. Paula looked down at the still figure on the bed. His hand was moving slowly across the bedsheet, the fingers groping toward her. Andy, she breathed. Andy, darling. His hand fell across hers, the touch feeble and aged. Paula, he whispered, say goodbye to the children for me. End of the Stuff by Henry Slazer A Traveler in Time by August Derleth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. A Traveler in Time by August Derleth. You can't always escape evils by running away from them, but it may help. Tell me what time is, said Harrigan one late summer afternoon in a Madison Street bar. I'd like to know. A dimension, I answered. Everybody knows that. All right, granted. I know space is a dimension, and you can move forward or back in space. And, of course, you keep on aging all the time. Elementary, I said. But what happens if you can move backward or forward in time? Do you age or get younger? Or do you keep the status quo? I'm not an authority on time, Tex. Do you know anyone who traveled in time? Harrigan shrugged aside my question. That was the thing I couldn't get out of Vanderkamp, either. He presumed to know everything else. Vanderkamp? He was another one of those strange people a reporter always runs into. Lived in New York, downtown, near the Bowery. Man of about forty, I'd say, but a little on the old-fashioned side. Dutch background. And hipped on the subject of New Amsterdam, which, in case you don't know, was the original name of New York City. Don't mind my interrupting, I cut in, but I'm not quite straight on what Vanderkamp has to do with time as dimension. Oh, he was touched on the subject. He claimed to travel in it. The fact is, he invented a time-traveling machine. You certainly meet the wax, Tex. Don't I? He grinned appreciatively and leaned reminiscently over the bar. But Vanderkamp had the wildest dreams of the lot. And in the end, he managed the neatest conjuring trick of them all. I was on the Brooklyn Enterprise at that time. I spent about a year there. Special features, though I was on a reporter's salary. Vanderkamp was something of a local celebrity in a minor way. He wrote articles on the early Dutch in New York, the nomenclature of the Dutch, the history of Dutch place names, and the like. He was handy with a pen, and even handier with tools. He was an amateur electrician, carpenter, house painter, and claimed to be an expert in genealogy. And he built a time-traveling machine. So he said. He gave me a rather hard time of it. He was a glib talker, and half the time I didn't know whether I was coming or going. He kept me on my toes by taking for granted that I accepted his basic premises. I got next to him on a tip. He could be close-mouthed as a clam, but his sister let things slip from time to time, and on this occasion she passed the word to one of her friends in a grocery store that her brother had invented a machine that took him off on trips into the past. It seemed like routine whack stuff, but Blake, who decided what went into the Enterprise and what didn't, sent me over to Manhattan to get something for the paper, on the theory that since Vanderkamp was well-known in Brooklyn, it was good neighborhood copy. Vanderkamp was a sharp-eyed little fellow, about five feet or so in height, and I hit him at a good time. His sister said he had just come back from a trip. She left me to draw my own conclusions about what kind of trip, and I found him in a mild fit of temper. He was too upset, in fact, to be truculent, which was more like his nature. 
Was it true, I wanted to know, that he'd invented a machine that traveled in time? He didn't make any bones about it. Certainly, he said. I've been using it for the last month, and if my sister hadn't decided to blab, nobody would know about it yet. What about it? You believe it can take you backwards or forwards into the past or the future? Do I look crazy? I said so, didn't I? Now, as a matter of fact, he did look crazy. Unlike most of the candidates for my file of queer people, Vanderkamp actually looked like a nut. He had a wild eye and a constantly working mouth. He blinked a good deal and stammered when he was excited. In features, he was as Dutch as his name implied. Well, we talked back and forth for some time. But I stuck with him, and in the end he took me out into a shed adjoining his house and showed me the contraption he'd built. It looked like a top. The first thing I thought of was Brick Bradford, and before I could catch myself I'd asked, Is that pure Brick Bradford? He didn't turn a hair. Not by a long shot, he answered. H.G. Wells was there first. I owe it to Wells. I see, I said. The hell you do, he shot back. You think I'm as nutty as a fruitcake. The idea of time travel is a little hard to swallow, I said. Sure it is, but me, I'm doing it. So that's all there is to it. If you don't mind, Mr. Vanderkamp, I said, I'm a dummy in scientific matters. I have all I can do to tell a nut from a bolt. That, I believe, he said. So how do you time travel? Look, he said, time is a dimension like space. You can go up or down this ruler, he snatched a steel ruler and waved it in front of me, from any given point. But you move. In the dimension of time, you only seem to move. You stand still. Time moves. Do you get it? I had to confess that I didn't. He tried again, with obviously strained patience. Judging by what I could gather from what he said, it was possible for him, so he believed, to get into his machine, twirl a few knobs, push a few buttons, relax for any given period, and end up just where he liked, back in the past or ahead in the future. But wherever he ended up, he was still in the same spot. In other words, whether he was back in 1492 or ahead in 2092, the place he got out of his time machine was still his present address. It was beyond me, frankly, but I figured that as long as he was a little touched, it wouldn't do any harm to humor him. I intimated that I understood and asked him where he'd been last. His face fell, his brow clouded, and he said, I've been ahead thirty years. He shook his head angrily. What a time! I'll be seventy, and you won't even be that, Mr. Harrigan. But we'll be in the middle of the worst atomic war you ever dreamed about. Now this was before Hiroshima quite a bit. I didn't know what he was talking about, but it gives me a queer feeling now and then when I think of what he said, especially since it's still short of thirty years since that time. It's no time to be living here, he went on. Direct hits on the entire area. What would you do? I'd get out, I said. That's what I thought, he said. But that kind of warfare carries a long way, a long way. And I'm a man who loves his comforts reasonably. I don't intend to set up housekeeping in equatorial Africa or the forests of Brazil. What did you see thirty years from now, Mr. Vanderkamp? I asked him. Everything blown to hell, he answered. Not a building in all Manhattan, he leered and added. And everybody who'll be living here at that time will be scattered into the atmosphere in fragments no bigger than an amoeba. You fill me with anticipation. I said. So I went back to my desk and wrote the story. You could guess what kind it had to be. Time travel is possible, says amateur scientist. That kind of thing. You can see it every week in large doses in the feature sections of some of the biggest chain papers. It went over like an average feature about life on the moon or prehistoric animals surviving in remote mountain valleys or what have you. Just what Vanderkamp went back to after I left I don't know but I have an idea that he gave his sister a devil of a time. 
Vanderkemp stalked into the house and confronted his sister. "'You see, Julie, a reporter. Can't you learn to hold your tongue?' She threw him a scornful glance. "'What difference does it make?' she cried. "'You're gone all the time. Maybe I'll take you along sometime. Just wait. Wait, wait. That's all I've been doing. Since I was ten years old I've been waiting on you.' Oh, the hell with it. He turned on his heel and left the house. She followed him to the door and shouted after him, Where are you going now? To New Amsterdam for a little peace and quiet, he said testily. He threw open the thick walled door of his time machine and pulled it shut behind him. He sat down before the controls and began to chart his course for 1650. If his calculations were correct, he would shortly find himself in the vicinity of that sturdy, if autocratic, first citizen of the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, Peter Stuyvesant, as well as Governor Stuyvesant's friend and neighbor, Heinrich Vanderkamp. He gave not even a figurative glance over his shoulder before he started out. When he emerged at last from his machine, he was in what appeared to be the backyard of a modest residence on a street which, though he did not know it, he suspected might be the Bowery. At the moment of his emergence, a tall, angular woman stood viewing him, open-mouthed and aghast, from the wooden stoop at the back door of her home. He looked at her in astonishment himself. The resemblance to his sister Julie was uncanny. With only the slightest hesitation, he addressed her in fluent Dutch. "'Pray do not be disturbed, young lady.' "'A fine way for a gentleman to call,' she exclaimed in a voice considerably more forceful than her appearance. "'I suppose my father sent you. And where did you get that outlandish costume?' "'I bought it,' he answered, truthfully enough. "'A likely tale,' she said. And if my father sent you, just go back and tell him I'm satisfied the way I am. No woman needs a man to manage her. I don't have the honor of your father's acquaintance, he answered. She gazed at him suspiciously from narrowed eyes. Everyone in New Amsterdam knows Henrik von Tromp. He's as unloved as yonder bumblebee. Stand where you are and say whence you come. "'I'm a visitor in New Amsterdam,' he said, standing obediently still. "'I confess I don't know my way about very well, and I chose to stop at this attractive home.' "'I know it's attractive,' she said tartly, "'and it's plain to see you're a stranger here, or you'd never be wearing such clothes. "'Or is it the fashion where you come from?' she gave him no opportunity to answer, "'but added after a moment of indecision, "'Well, you look respectable enough.' though much like my rascally cousin Peter Vanderkamp. Do you know him? No. Well, no matter. He's much older than you, near forty blessed years. You're no more than twenty, I don't doubt. Involuntarily, Vanderkamp put his hand to his cheek and smiled as he felt its smooth roundness. You may be right at that, he said cryptically. You might as well come in, she said grudgingly, what with the traffic on the road outside, the Indians, and people who come in such flighty vehicles as yours, I might as well live in the heart of the colony. He looked around. And still, he said, it is a pleasant spot. Peaceful, comfortable. I'm sure a man could live out his days here in contentment. Oh, could he, she said belligerently. And where would I be while this went on? He gazed at her beetling nose, her jutting chin. A good question, he muttered thoughtfully. He followed her into the house. It was a treasury of antiquities, filling him with delight. Miss Anna von Tromp offered him a cup of milk, which he accepted, thanking her profusely. She talked volubly, eyeing him all the while with the utmost curiosity, and he gathered presently that her father had made several attempts to marry her off, disapproving of her solitary residence so far from the center of the city. But she had frowned upon one and all of the suitors he had encouraged to call on her. She was undeniably impressive, almost formidable, he conceded, privately with a touch of the shrew in Herodin. Life with Miss Anna von Tromp would not be easy, he reflected, 
But then life with his sister Julie was not easy, either. Miss Anna, however, had not to face atomic warfare. All she had to look forward to in fourteen years was surrender to the besieging British, which she would have no trouble in surviving. He settled down to his ingratiating best, and succeeded in making a most favorable impression on Miss Anna von Trump, before at last he took his leave, carrying with him a fine hand-wrought bowl with which the lady had presented him. He had a hunch he might come back. Of all the times he had visited since finishing the machine, he knew that old New Amsterdam in the 1650s was the one period most likely to keep him contented, provided Miss Van Trump didn't turn out to be a nuisance. So he took careful note of the set of his controls, jotting them down so that he would not be likely to forget them. It was late when he found himself back in his own time. His sister was waiting up for him. Two o'clock in the morning, she screamed at him. What are you doing to me? Oh, God, why didn't I marry when I had the chance instead of throwing away my life on a worthless brother? Why don't you? It's not too late, he sighed wearily. How can you say that, she snapped bitterly. Here I am, thirty nearly, and worn out from working for you. Who would marry me now? Oh, if only I could have another chance. If I could be young again and do it all over, I'd know how to have a better life. In spite of his boredom with her, Vanderkamp felt the effect of this cry from a lonely heart. He looked at her pityingly. It was true, after all, that she had worked faithfully for him, without pay, since their parents died. "'Take a look at this,' he said gently, offering her the bowl. "'Ha! Can we eat bowls?' He raised his eyes heavenward and went wearily to bed. "'I saw Vanderkamp again about a fortnight later,' Harrigan went on. "'Ran into him in a tavern on the Bowery. He recognized me and came over.' "'That was some story you did,' he said. "'Been bothered by cranks?' I asked. "'Hell, yes! Not too badly, though. "'They want to ride off somewhere just to get away. "'I get that feeling myself sometimes, but tell me, have you seen the morning papers?' "'Now, by coincidence, the papers that morning had carried a story from some local nuclear physicist "'about the increasing probability that the atom would be smashed. "'I told him I'd seen it. "'What did I tell you?' he said. "'I just smiled and asked where he'd been lately. "'He didn't hesitate to talk, "'perhaps because his sister had been giving him a hard time with her nagging. "'So I listened. "'It appeared to hear him tell it "'that he had been off visiting the Dutch in New Amsterdam. "'You could almost believe what he said, listening to him, "'except for that wild look he had. "'Anyway, he'd been in New Amsterdam about 1650, and he brought back a few trifling souvenirs of the trips. Would I like to see them? I said I would. I figured he'd got his hands on some nice antiques and wanted an appreciative audience. His sister wasn't home, so he took me around and showed me his pieces, one by one. A bowl, a pair of wooden candlesticks, wooden shoes, and more, all in all, a fine collection. He even had a chair that looked pretty authentic and I wondered where he dug up so many nice things of the New Amsterdam period, though, of course, I had to take his word as to where they belonged historically. I didn't know, but I imagine he got them somewhere in the city or perhaps in the Catskill country. Well, after a while, I got another look at his contraption. It didn't appear to have been moved at all. It was still sitting where it had been before, without a sign to say that it had been used to go anywhere least of all into past time tell me i said to him at last when you go back in time do you get younger yes and no he said obviously it wasn't obvious to me but i couldn't get any more than that out of him the thing i couldn't figure out was the reason for his claim he wasn't trying to sell anything to anybody as far as i could see he wasn't anxious to tell the world about his time machine either he didn't mind talking in his oblique fashion about his trips. He did talk about New Amsterdam as if he had pretty good acquaintance with the place, but then he was known as a minor authority on the customs of the Dutch colony. 
He was touched, obviously, just the same. He challenged me, in a way. I wanted to know something more about him, how his machine worked, how he took off, and so on. I made up my mind the next time I was in the neighborhood to look him up, hoping he wouldn't be home. When I made it, his sister was alone, and in a fine fellow, as cantankerous as a flea-bitten mastiff. He's gone again, she complained bitterly. Clearly the two of them were at odds. I asked her whether she had seen him go. She hadn't. He had just marched out to his shop, and that was an end to him as far as she was concerned. I haggled around quite a lot, and finally got her permission to go out and see what I could see for myself. Of course, the shop was locked. I had counted on that and brought along a handy little skeleton key. I was inside in no time. The machine wasn't there. Not a sign of it or of Van de Camp either. Now I looked around all over, but I couldn't for the life of me figure out how he could have taken it out of that place. It was too big for doors or windows, and the walls and roof were solid and immovable. I figured that he couldn't have got such a large machine away without his sister seeing him, so I locked the place up and went back to the house. But she was immovable. She hadn't seen a thing. If he had taken anything larger than pocket size out of that shop of his, she had missed it. I could hardly doubt her sincerity. There was nothing to be had from that source, so I had no alternative but to wait for him another time. Anna Van Tromp, considerably chastened, watched her strange suitor. She looked upon all men as suitors without exception, for so her father had conditioned her to do, as he reached into his sack and brought out another wonder. Now this, said Van der Kamp, is an alarm clock. You wind it up like this, you see, set it, and off it goes. Listen to it ring. That will wake you up in the morning. More magic, she cried doubtfully. No, no, he explained patiently. It's an everyday thing in my country. Perhaps some day you would like to join me in a little visit there, Anna. Yeah, maybe, she agreed, looking out the window to his weird and frightening carriage, which had no animal to draw it, and which vanished so strangely, fading away into the air, whenever Vanderkamp went into it. This clothes-washing machine you talk about, she admitted, this I would like to see. I must go now, said Vanderkamp, gazing at her with well-simulated coyness. I'll leave these things here with you. And I'll just take along that bench over there. Yeah, yeah, said Anna, blushing. Six of one and half a dozen of the other, muttered Vanderkamp, comparing Anna with his sister. He got into his time machine and set out for home in the twentieth century. There was some reluctance in his going. Here all was somnolent peace and quiet, despite the rigors of living. In his own time there were wars and turmoil, and the ultimate threat of the greatest war of all. New Amsterdam had one drawback, however, the presence of Anna von Trapp. She had grown fond of him, undeniably, perhaps because he was so much more interested in her circumstances than in herself. What was a man to do? Julie at one end, Anna at the other. But even getting rid of Julie would not allow him to escape the warfare to come. He thought deeply of his problem all the way home. When he got back, he found his sister waiting up, as usual, ready to deliver the customary diatribe. He forestalled her. I've been thinking things over, Julie. I believe you'd be much happier if you were living with Brother Carl. I'll give you as much money as you need. You can pack your things, and I'll take you down to Louisiana. Take me, she exclaimed. How? In that crazy contraption of yours? Precisely. Oh, no, she said. You don't get me into that machine. How do I know what it will do to me? It's a time machine, isn't it? It might make an old hag of me. Or a baby. You said that you wanted to be young again, didn't you? He said softly. You said you'd like another chance. A faraway look came into her eyes. Oh, if only I could. If only I could be a girl again with a chance to get married. Pack your things, Vanderkamp said quietly. 
"'It must have been all of a month before I saw Vanderkamp again,' Harrigan continued, waving for another scotch and soda. "'I was down in the vicinity on an assignment, and I took a run over to his place. "'He was home this time. He came to the door, which he had chained on the inside. "'He recognized me, and it was plain at the same time that he had no intention of letting me in. "'I came right out with the first question I had in mind.' The thing that bothers me, I said to him, is how you get that time machine of yours in and out of that shed. Mr. Harrigan, he answered, newspaper reporters ought to have at least elementary scientific knowledge. You don't. How in hell could even a time machine be in two places at once, I ask you? If I take that machine back three centuries, that's where it is. Not here. And three centuries ago, that shop wasn't standing there. So you don't go in or out. You don't move at all, remember? It's time that moves. I called the other day, I went on. Your sister spoke to me. Give her my regards. My sisters left me, he said shortly, to stew, as you might say, in my own time machine. Really, I said. Just what do you have in mind to do next? Let me ask you something, Mr. Harrigan, he answered. Would you sit around here waiting for an atomic war if you could get away? Certainly not, I answered. Well, then, I don't intend to either. All this while he was standing at the door, refusing to open it any wider or to let me in. He was making it pretty plain that there wasn't much he had to say to me, and he seemed to be in a hurry. "'Remember me to the inquiring public thirty years hence, Mr. Harrigan,' he said at last, and closed the door. That was the last I saw of him. Harrigan finished his scotch and soda appreciatively and looked around for the bartender. "'Did he take off, then?' I asked. "'Like a rocket,' said Harrigan. "'Queerest thing was that there wasn't a trace of him. The machine was gone, too, the same way as the last time, without a disturbance in the shop.' He and his machine had simply vanished off the face of the earth and were never heard from again. Matter of fact, though, Harrigan went on thoughtfully, Vanderkamp's disappearance wasn't the really queer angle on the pitch. The other thing broke in the papers the week after he left. The neighbors got pretty worked up about it. They called the police to tell them that Vanderkamp's sister Julie was back, only she was off her nut, and a good deal changed in appearance, too. A gal going blarmy was no news, of course, but that last bit about her appearance, they said she looked about twenty years older, all of a sudden, sort of rang a bell. So I went over there. It was Julie, all right, at least. She looked a hell of a lot like Julie had when I last saw her, provided you could grant that a woman could age twenty years in the few weeks it had been. And she was off a rocker, sure enough, or hysterical or at least madder than a wet hen. She made out like she couldn't speak a word of English, and they finally had to get an interpreter to understand her. She wouldn't speak anything but Dutch, and an old-fashioned kind, too. She made a lot of extravagant claims, and kept insisting that she would bring the whole matter up in a complaint before Governor Stuyvesant. Said she wasn't Julie Vanderkamp, by God, but was named Anna Van Tromp, which is an old Dutch name thereabouts, and claimed that she had been abducted from her home on the Bowery. We pointed out the Third Avenue L and told her that was the Bowery, but she just sniffed and looked at us as though we were crazy. I toyed with my drink. You mean you actually listened to the poor girl's story, I asked? Sure, Harrigan said. Maybe she was as crazy as a bed bug but I've listened to wackier stories from supposedly sane people. Sure, I listened to her. He paused thoughtfully for a moment, then went on. She claimed that this fellow Vanderkamp had come to her house and filled her with a lot of guff about the wonderful country he lived in and how she ought to let him take her to see it. Apparently, he waxed especially eloquent about an automatic washing machine and dryer, and that had fascinated her for some reason. Then, she said, he brought a ten-year-old girl along. The where-in-the-world old Vanderkamp could have picked 
a patat like that is beyond me. And the kid had added her blandishments to the plot. Between them, they had managed to lure her into the old guy's machine. From what she said, it was obviously the time machine she was talking about. And if she was Julie, there was no reason why she shouldn't know about it. But she talked as though it was a complete mystery to her, as though she'd no idea what the purpose of it was. Well, anyway, here she was, and very unhappy, too. Wanted to go back to old New Amsterdam, but bad. It was a beautiful act, even if she was nuts. The strange thing was, though, that there were some things even a gal going wacky couldn't explain. For instance, the house was filled with what the experts said were priceless antiques from Dutch New Amsterdam, of the period just prior to the British siege. You'd think those things would make poor Julie feel more at home, seeing as she claimed to belong in that period, but apparently they just made her homesick. And curiously enough, all the modern gadgets were gone. All those handy little items that make the 20th century so livable had been taken away, including the washing machine and dryer, by the way. Julie, or Anna, as she called herself, claimed that Vanderkamp had taken it back with him, wherever he'd gone to, after he'd brought her there. Poor woman, I said sympathetically. They toted her off to the booby hatch, I suppose. No, Harrigan said slowly. They didn't, as a matter of fact. Since she was harmless, they let her stay in the house for a while, which was a mistake, it seems. Of course, she wasn't from the 17th century. That's impossible. All the same, he broke off abruptly and stared moodily into his glass. What happened to her? I asked. She was found one morning about two weeks after she got there, he said, dead, electrocuted. It seems she'd stuck her finger into the light socket while standing in a bathtub full of water. An accident, obviously. As the medical examiner said, it was an accident any six-year-old child would have known enough about electricity to avoid. That is, Harrigan added, a twentieth-century child. End of A Traveler in Time by August Derleth A Bad Day for Vermin by Keith Laumer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman A Bad Day for Vermin by Keith Laumer They came in friendship and love. They couldn't help the way they looked. Judge Carter Gates of the Third Circuit Court finished his chicken salad on whole wheat, thoughtfully crumpled the wax paper bag and turned to drop it in the wastebasket behind his chair, and sat transfixed. Through his second-floor office window, he saw a forty-foot flower petal shape of pale turquoise settling gently between the well-tended petunia beds on the courthouse lawn. On the upper or stem end of the vessel, a translucent pink panel popped up, and a slender, graceful form, not unlike a large violet caterpillar, undulated into view. Judge Gates whirled to the telephone. Half an hour later, he put it to the officials gathered with him in a tight group on the lawn. Boys, this thing is intelligent. Any fool can see that. It's putting together what my boy assures me is some kind of talking machine, and any minute now it's going to start communicating. It's been twenty minutes since I notified Washington on this thing. It won't be long before somebody back there decides this is top secret and slaps a freeze on us here that will make the Manhattan Project look like a publicity campaign. Now, I say this is the biggest thing that ever happened to Plum County, and if we don't aim to be put right out of the picture, we'd better move fast. What you got in mind, Judge? I propose we hold an open hearing right here in the courthouse the minute that thing gets its gear to working. We'll put it on the air. Tom Clembers from the radio station's already stringing wires, I see. 
Too bad we've got no TV equipment, but Jody Heard has a movie camera. We'll put Willow Grove on the map bigger than Cape Canaveral ever was. We're with you on that, Carter. Ten minutes after the melodious voice of the Fianna's translator had requested escort to the village headman, the visitor was looking over the crowded courtroom, with an expression reminiscent of a St. Bernard puppy, hoping for a romp. The rustle of feet and throat-clearing subsided, and the speaker began. People of the green world, happy the cycle. Heads turned at the clump of feet coming down the side aisle, a heavy torsoed man of middle age, bald, wearing a khaki shirt and trousers and rimless glasses, and with a dark leather holster slapping his hip at each step, cleared the front row of seats, planted himself, feet apart, yanked a heavy nickel-plated forty-four revolver from the holster, took aim, and fired five shots into the body of the Friana at a range of ten feet. The violet form whipped convulsively, writhed from the bench to the floor with a sound like a wet fire hose being dropped, uttered a gasping twitter, and lay still. The gunman turned, dropped the pistol, threw up his hands, and called, Sheriff Hoskins, I'm putting myself in your protective custody. There was a moment of stunned silence, then a rush of spectators for the alien. The sheriff's three hundred and nine pound bulk bellied through the shouting mob to take up the stand before the khaki clad man. I always knew you was a mean one, Cecil Stump, he said, unlimbering the handcuffs. Ever since I seen you making up those ground glass baits for Joe Potter's dog, but I never thought I'd see you turn to cold blooded murder. He waved at the bystanders. Clear a path through here. I'm taking my prisoner over to the jail. Just a dad blame minute, Sheriff. Stump's face was pale. His glasses were gone, and one khaki shoulder strap dangled. But what was almost a grin twisted one meaty cheek. He hid his hands behind his back, leaning away from the cuffs. I don't like the word prisoner. I ask for your protection. And better look out who you're throwing the word murder off at, too. I ain't murdered nobody. The sheriff blinked, turned to roar. How's that victim, Doc? A small gray head rose from bending over the limp form of the Fianna. Deader than a mackerel, Sheriff. I guess that's it. We'll go, Cecil. What's the charge? First degree murder. Who'd I murder? Why, you killed this here, this stranger. That ain't no stranger. That's a varmint. Murder's got to do with killing humans, the way I understand it. You're going to tell me that that thing's human? Ten people shouted at once. Human as I am, intelligent being. Tell me you can simply kill. Must be some kind of law. The sheriff raised his hands, his jowls drawn down in a scowl. What about it, Judge Gates? Any law against Cecil Stump killing the... Uh... The judge thrust out his lower lip. Well, let's see, he began. Technically. Good Lord, somebody blurted. You mean the laws on murder don't define what constitutes... I mean, what... What a humorin is, Cecil snorted. Whatever it says, it sure, Bob, don't include no purple worms. That's a varmint, pure and simple. Ain't no different killing it than any other critter. Then by God we'll get him on malicious damage, a man called, or hunting without a license out of season, carrying concealed weapons. Stump went for his hip pocket, stumbled out a fat, shapeless wallet, extracted a thumbed rectangle of folded paper, offered it. I'm a licensed exterminator. I got a permit to carry a gun, too. I ain't broken no law. He grinned openly now. Just doing my job, Sheriff, and at no charge to the county. A smaller man with bristling red hair flared his nostrils at Stump. You bloodthirsty idiot, he raised a fist and shook it. We'll be a national disgrace. Worse than Little Rock. Lynch is too good for you. Hold on there, Weinstein, the sheriff cut in. Let's not go getting no lynch talk started. Lynch, is it? Cecil Stump bellowed, his face suddenly red. Why, I done a favor for every man here. Now you listen to me. What is that thing over there? He jerked a blunt thumb toward the judicial bench. It's some kind of critter from Mars or some place. You know that as well as me. And what's it here for? It ain't for the good of the likes of you or me, I can tell you that. It's them or us. And this time, by God, we got in the first lick. Why, you, you hate monger? Now hold on right there. 
I'm as liberal-minded as the next feller. Hell, I like a black, and I can't hardly tell a Jew from a white man. But when it comes to taking in a purple worm and calling it humern, that's where I draw the line. Sheriff Hoskins pushed between Stump and the surging front rank of the crowd. Stay back there. I want you to disperse peaceably and let the law handle this. I figure I'll push off now, Sheriff, Stump hitched up his belt. I figured you might have to calm em down right at first. But now they've had a chance to think it over and see I ain't broken no law. Ain't none of these law-abiding folks going to do anything illegal, like trying to get rough with a licensed exterminator just doing his job. He stooped to retrieve his gun. Here, I'll take that, Sheriff Hoskins said. You can consider your gun license canceled, and your exterminating license too. Stump grinned again, handed the revolver over. Sure, I'm cooperative, Sheriff. Anything you say, send it around to my place when you're done with it. He pushed his way through the crowd to the corridor door. The rest of you stay put, a portly man with a head of bushy white hair pushed his way through to the bench. I'm calling an emergency town meeting to order right here and now. He banged the gavel on the scarred bench top, glanced down at the body of the dead alien, now covered by a flag. Gentlemen, we've got to take fast action. If the wire services get a hold of this before we've gone on record, Willow Grove will be a blighted area. Look here, Willard, Judge Gates said, rising. This, this mob isn't competent to take legal action. Never mind what's legal, Judge. Sure, this calls for federal legislation, maybe a constitutional amendment. But in the meantime, we're going to define what constitutes a person within the incorporated limits of Willow Grove. That's the least we can do, a thin-faced woman snapped, glaring at Judge Gates. Do you think we're going to sit here and condone this outrage? Nonsense, Gates said. I don't like what happened any better than you do. But a person, well... A person's got to have two arms and two legs, and— Shape's got nothing to do with it, the chairman cut in. Bears walk on two legs. Dave Zawaki lost his in the war. Monkeys have hands. Any intelligent creature, the woman started. Nope, that won't do either. My unfortunate cousin's boy Melvin was born an imbecile, poor lad. Now, folks, there's no time to waste. We'll find it very difficult to formulate a satisfactory definition based on considerations such as these. However, I think we can resolve the question in terms that will form a basis for future legislation on the question. It's going to make some big changes in things. Hunters aren't going to like it. The meat industry will be affected. But if, as it appears, we've entered into an era of contact with, uh, creatures from other worlds, we got to get our house in order. You tell him, Senator, somebody yelled. We better leave this for Congress to figure out, another voice insisted. We got to do something. The Senator held up his hands. Quiet, everybody. There'll be reporters here in a matter of minutes. Maybe our ordinance won't hold water, but it'll start em thinking, and it'll make a lot better copy for Willow Grove than the killing. What you got in mind, Senator? Just this, the Senator said solemnly. A person is any harmless creature. P. chuffled. Somebody coughed. What about a man who commits a violent act, then? Judge Gates demanded. What's he, huh? That's obvious, gentlemen, the senator said flatly. He's vermin. On the courthouse steps, Cecil Stump stood, hands in hip pockets, talking to a reporter from the big town paper in Mantoon, surrounded by a crowd of latecomers who had missed the excitement inside. He described the accuracy of his five shots, the sound they had made hitting the big blue snake, and the ludicrous spectacle the latter had presented in its death agony. He winked at a foxy man in overalls, picking his nose at the edge of the crowd. "'Guess it'll be a while for any damn reptiles move in here like they own the place,' he concluded. The courthouse doors banged wide, excited citizens pouring forth, veering aside from Cecil Stump. The crowd around him, thin, broke up as his members collared those emerging with hot news. The reporter picked a target. Perhaps you'd care to tell me a few details of the action taken by the, uh, special committee, sir. Senator Custis pursed his lips. A session of the town council was called, he said. 
We've defined what a person is in this town. Stump, standing ten feet away, snorted. Can't touch me with no ex post factory law. And also, what can be classified as vermin, Custis went on. Stump closed his mouth with a snap. Here, that's supposed to be some kind of slam at me, Custis. By God, come election time. Above, the door opened again. A tall man in a leather jacket stepped out, stood looking down. The crowd pressed back. Senator Custis and the reporter moved aside. The newcomer came down the steps slowly. He carried Cecil Stump's nickel-plated forty-four in his hand. Standing alone now, Stump watched him. Here, he said, his voice carrying a sudden note of strain. Who are you? The man reached the foot of the steps, raised the revolver, and cocked it with a thumb. I'm the new exterminator, he said. End of Bad Day for Vermin by Keith Laumer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.